you will hear a new student, Tom, talking to a student representative called Rachel about university clubs. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 4. Hi, welcome to Freshers' Week. I'm Rachel. Can I help you? Oh, hi. Yes, um, I was hoping to find out about some clubs I could join. Well, all the club stands are here in this hall. What were you interested in? Um, not sure. <laughs> I wanted to do something where I could meet people. Well, take this leaflet with details of all the clubs and see what you think. Oh. It'll probably depend on what day you're free. Like on Mondays, there's the film club. Then on Tuesdays, you've got the climbing club. That's really good. I'm in that. <laughs> <laughs> then on Wednesdays, you've got chess, if you want something a bit more intellectual. But you should look through carefully because all the clubs run extra activities as well as their normal meetings. Oh, yes, I see. So, it looks like the film club has discussions after the films. I'd quite like to go to those. Then, climbing. <laughs> Goodness. It says here that the university has its own climbing wall. That's impressive. And they go on weekend trips. Mm. Cool. And it says the chess club normally just does games with whoever turns up. But it also runs competitions sometimes. But I bet you've got to be pretty good to do that. Yes, I think so. And how many people are in the clubs? Are they all really full? Well, obviously they're all different. So, for example, the film club has just increased its membership from 85 to 125. But I think they're hoping to extend it to 150. The climbing club's quite small, 40 people. And the chess club is fairly healthy at 55. Right. OK. So who do I see if I want to join these clubs? Well, if you go round the stands and speak to the people there. For the film club, that's the events organiser. Um, for climbing, you'll need the club secretary. And the chess club is organised by one of the maths tutors. OK? Yep. <laughs> I think I'll start with the climbing club. It sounds good. Oh, well, as I said, I'm in that, so I might be able to help you a bit. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 5 to 10. OK. It says in the leaflet that they get together twice a month. Is that right? Yes. Oh, you must join. It's really good fun. <laughs> we go away quite a bit to North Wales, and every year we have a special excursion, usually to France, which is where we're going this year in the spring. The weather's too unpredictable in the autumn. Wow. That sounds good. But it must cost a lot. Yeah, but we try and save up for it through subscriptions. So rather than having a huge sum to pay in the month we go, we collect those weekly, so it spreads it out. Good idea. I think I'll definitely join. There are quite good benefits you get from joining. I mean, you need that, don't you? And the university clubs normally try and do deals with local businesses. So it's really worth joining. Like in the climbing club, they've got a special arrangement with one of the shops in town. So if you show your card, you can get money off equipment. Don't think the discount extends to clothes, though. That's really worth it, then.
I'll go over and talk to them now. OK. Hope you do join. <laughs> oh, and another thing I meant to say. If you do become a member, you automatically receive a magazine once a year. It's quite useful and interesting because it goes out to all the national climbing clubs. And the other thing is, if you come to every session, then you can get a complimentary ticket to the big exhibition that's held in Cardiff every year. So, hope to see you. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello, Sue. Fancy meeting you here. It is Sue Johnson, isn't it? Oh, hi, Jill. Yeah, it must be ages since we've seen each other. What a surprise. How are you? Yes, well, uh, I'm fine. I just got back from two years teaching in Hong Kong, actually. Oh, I thought you'd gone into computing or nursing. No, I ended up being a teacher after all. And how about you? Oh, fine. Things are going quite well, in fact. So, what have you been up to over the last three years? Working, studying, you know, the usual things. Oh, and I got married last year. Congratulations. Anyone I know? Yeah, you might remember him from our college days. Do you remember Jerry? Jerry Fox? Jerry? Was he the one with the dark hair and beard? No, that was Sam. No, Jerry's got blonde hair and glasses. He's pretty tall. Well, we got married, finally. Great. And where did the wedding take place? Was it here in London? No, in the end, we decided to get married in Scotland. Jerry's parents lived there, so we were married in the small village church with the mountains in the background. Fabulous. Have you got any pictures? Well, funny you should ask. I have actually got a couple here. They're a bit battered because I've been carrying them around in my bag. <laughs> oh, never mind. Let's have a look. Oh, don't you look wonderful. Who are those people behind you? Oh, that's my older sister, Clara. Oh, she looks like you. Do you think so? Everyone says that, but we can't see it. Is she married now? Yes, and she's got three children, a girl and twin boys as well. Wow, imagine having twins. Look, why don't we have dinner together and catch up on a few things? Would you like to come over one evening? Oh, that'd be lovely. What about next Friday evening? Fine. What time? Shall I come over about eight o'clock? Oh, come about half past seven. I'm usually home around 6.30, so that'd give me plenty of time to get dinner ready. Oh, fine. And um, one last thing. Where do you live? What's the address? <laughs> oh, good thinking. Here's my card. The address is on the back. We've got a flat in an old house. We live on the third floor of a large old house. 
The house has been converted into flats, so when you arrive, you'll need to press the bell second from the top. The bell second from the top, okay? There's a little intercom arrangement, so I can let you in. Right, okay, see you on Friday then. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Welcome, Jill. This is my husband, Jerry. Jerry, this is Jill. Hi, Jill. Nice to meet you. Uh, hi, Jerry. Well, let's come in and take a seat. Sue told me that you've just returned from Hong Kong. Uh, was it a pleasant trip? What kind of city is it? Oh, well, Hong Kong enjoys a reputation for the flourishing business. It has a population of around 6.6 .6 million. Much larger than that of Sydney, right? Sydney has a population of 4 million, I think. Yes, uh, did you enjoy staying there? Well, being a metropolis has advantages. You get the latest films and music. There's always something going on, and there's such a wide variety of different people and cultures that it's difficult to get bored. Of course, all this has its downside. The cost of living is very expensive, and most people cannot afford to go out very often. So although the entertainment is available, you have to have a lot of money to enjoy it. Another problem is, like most big cities, there's a lot of crime. What about the weather? I suppose that it gets a lot of rain. Mm, not always. In summer it's humid, but it's cool and dry in winter. The average temperature in June and July is about 91 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than here. The best seasons are spring and autumn. They are mild and agreeable. Is there anything you particularly miss of staying there? Yes, the tasty local food is to my liking, especially the seafood. Hong Kong also enjoys the fame of a paradise for shopping. But I'm not very keen on that, you know. I suppose it must be your favourite. Most shopping malls in Hong Kong have longer opening hours than those in Sydney. Some are even open the whole night during the Christmas holidays. Oh, it sounds lovely. I hope I have a chance to travel there. And I can be your tour guide. Yes, that's great. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a potential student at Clevedon College and a representative in the Information Center. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. 
Good morning, Clevedon College. Can I help you? Yes, please. I'd like some information about evening courses this term. Okay. Which subjects are you interested in? Two subjects, actually: languages and computer skills. Okay. What languages are you interested in? Actually, I'm not sure. I have to fulfil a language requirement for school, but I haven't really decided what language to study. Hmm. How many language courses do you run each week? We have two every night, from Monday to Friday. I'm sorry, but would you mind going through the schedule for me? Hmm. Which language on which days? Not at all. Monday to Wednesday are modern European languages: French, Spanish, German, Dutch, and Polish. Thursday night we offer ancient languages, Latin and ancient Greek, and on Friday we finish off with the Asian languages of Hindi and Bengali. Monday to Wednesday, modern European. Thursday, ancient languages, and Friday, Asian. Can you spell Bengali, please? Yes, it's B E N G A L I. Great. And how much do the courses cost? Each course costs twenty-five pound per person per term. But if you want to do two language courses, there's a ten percent discount, but only if you book for two terms. So the ten percent discount is if I take two courses for two terms. Is that right? Right. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Would it be possible for me to book my classes right now? No, sorry, the computer's down. What I suggest you do is call extension nine six nine four. Oh no, sorry, six nine nine four after six p.m. and ask for Mrs. Johnson. I'm sorry. I didn't get that. Did you say six nine nine four after six p.m.? Yes, six nine nine four. Please ask for Mrs. Johnson. Thanks. Okay. Can we now look at the computer skill courses? Yes, of course. Computer classes always start in the first week of the month, and the way it works is we offer one computer class for the entire month. So you might spend one month on databases, another month on Excel, and so on. Classes meet once a week on Tuesday afternoons. The next class starts February first. Okay, so for the upcoming month, February. February is going to be databases. There are twenty-four places still free on that course, and it costs forty pound per person. February. Databases, twenty-four openings, forty pounds. Okay. Excel starts in March, and that's nearly full. Only four slots left. It's forty-five pounds. Okay, Excel, March, only four slots left. Got it. April is Outlook. That is never as popular since it costs so much more, but you get a free CD. It is sixty pounds for the month. And there are nineteen places left. Okay, April, Outlook, sixty pounds. Is that it? No. On the third of June, we start a word course. We have sixteen vacancies for that at the moment. It's also expensive at fifty-five pounds. Third of June, word, sixteen vacancies, fifty-five pounds. Now, do I call the same number to book a place in one of these classes? No, you have to call Mary Jones. I think yes, Mary Jones. 
extension 9623. Sorry, could you repeat that number? Yes, extension 9623. Please call her before 6pm. OK, many thanks for all your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about the English policeman. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The English policeman has several nicknames, but the most frequently used are Copper and Bobby. The first name comes from the verb to cop, which is also slang, meaning to take or to capture. And the second comes from the first name of Sir Robert Peel, the 19th century politician who was the founder of the police force as we know it today. An early nickname for the policeman was Peeler, but this one has died out. Whatever we may call them, the general opinion of the police seems to be a favourable one, except, of course, among the criminal part of the community, where the police are given more derogatory nicknames which originated in America, such as Fuzz or Pig. Visitors to England seem nearly always to be very impressed by the English police. It has, in fact, become a standing joke that the visitor to Britain, when asked for his views of the country, will always say, at some point or other, I think your policemen are wonderful. Well, the British Bobby may not always be wonderful, but he is usually a very friendly and helpful sort of character. A music hall song of some years ago was called, If you want to know the time, ask a policeman. Nowadays, most people own watches, but they still seem to find plenty of other questions to ask the policemen. In London, the policemen spend so much of their time directing visitors about the city that one wonders how they ever find time to do anything else. Two things are immediately noticeable to the stranger when he sees an English policeman for the first time. The first is that he does not carry a pistol, and the second is that he wears a very distinctive type of headgear, the policeman's helmet. His helmet, together with his height, enables an English policeman to be seen from a considerable distance, a fact that is not without its usefulness. From time to time it is suggested that the policeman should be given a pistol and that his helmet should be taken from him. But both these suggestions are resisted by the majority of the public and the police themselves. However, the police have not resisted all changes. Radios, police cars and even helicopters give them greater mobility now. The policeman's lot is not an enviable one, even in a country which prides itself on being reasonably law-abiding. But, on the whole, the English policeman fulfils his often thankless task with courtesy and good humour, and with an understanding of the fundamental fact that the police are the country's servants, and not its masters. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. 
Thank you.